another Wednesday night service. I trust everyone so far has had a really blessed day. This evening we will celebrate God's glory with the usage of a hymn that we may not have sung in quite some time. In joyful highs and holy lays, we will begin with that hymn. Then we'll be followed, it will be followed with hymn number 240, Fairest Lord Jesus. And then hymn number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. So we shall begin this evening service with in joyful highs and holy lays.
glass. Sing them over again to me. Loving Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful and thankful for this evening's program. We are thankful for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. We ask first that you forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all our righteousness. We know the times that we are in there, God, and we must be thankful for our life, for health, for strength, for guidance and protection, for your mercy upon Trinidad and Tobago, dear. Lord, we are thankful that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The devil wanted to kill us, God, but God. The devil seeks to discourage us, but God. The devil seeks to destroy us, but God, you intervene and you protect us and safeguard us and watch us. Dear God, we are not worthy of your mercy. But we are thankful that your mercies are new every morning. We pray in a special way for Trinidad and today. As we wrestle with the COVID pandemic, dear Father, we pray for those in positions of authority. For those who care for our, our patients, dear God. For those who are frontline workers, we pray for them at this time. We pray that you will guard them, you will protect them, you will protect them from this pandemic dear father you protect them from this coronavirus we pray for all of our citizens that we would be careful and watchful that we will be temperate dear god and listen to the words of the authorities but moreover that we listen to your word that tells us to be wise dear god to be wise as serpents and harmless as those help us to wash our hands and sanitize dear god wear our masks that we will be safe from this coronavirus pandemic we pray for those who have lost jobs for those who have been financially impacted those who have businesses those who have been negatively affected by this pandemic you said a cattle on a thousand hills are yours they go on so we pray that they would continue to be faithful in their tide returns and their offering giving and that your word your promise 
that said that you will press it down and have it running over for them, dear Father, when we know you can't lie. We pray in a special way for our country, for the safety of our citizens. We pray that you will continue to protect us from harm and danger. But dear Father, that even as we see these troubling times, we would look up because we know our redemption draws now. We pray for our, our, our senior citizens, dear Father, our folks in our churches, dear Father. We are forced to be physically distant, dear God, but we know that our church is not closed. We do not have a physical service, but you have blessed us with the technology that we can consistently come together. Help us not to take for granted your word or to take for granted the fellowship of your saints, dear Father. In the assembly of, your, of our brethren, we pray that you will continue to bless us to these ends. Help that we would flatten the curve, that we would be able to be back in church and back together where we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Dear Father, we pray for our young children, our students, dear Father, who have to deal with another term online. We pray for those parents who may not have the means to have a computer or a tablet or a phone readily available. We pray that you will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on them that they will be able to acquire the right technology and the right tools that their children will be able to do in their father. We pray for all of our children. We know this is a difficult time, a time where they must be physically distant and socially distant. But we pray, even as they are socially distant and physically distant from each other, that they will not be distant from you. That you will bless them in a mighty and mighty way and you remind them daily that you are there for them all the way. Dear Father, we pray for this new week that is coming. We know that the devil will seek to discourage us, but God. The devil will seek to destroy us, but God. There's some bill that we may not be able to afford, but God. There's some illness coming our way, but God. Some, some criminal element, but God. Something that is seeking to destroy our peace. But we know that you will intervene. Bless us. To these ends we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Welcome to another edition of Take 5, a 5 minute feature designed to inspire and motivate you. Are you living with regret? Are you experiencing feelings of guilt and shame? Is it an opportunity that you've missed and now you are wallowing in a pool of what ifs? Or maybe it is something that you've done or even something that you have failed to do. I've captured our discourse this evening, new every day. You see, regret like its cousins, self-doubt and fear, it can rob us of our joy. It can rob us of our peace of mind. It can rob us of our hope and keep us trapped living in the past. But Romans 8, and this is one and two gives us a promise and it says there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus and because you belong to him the power of the life given spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death this tells me that Christ has freed us it tells me that he does not condemn us so if Christ has freed you, and if Christ does not condemn you, why are you condemning yourself? One of the first steps to getting over regret is to forgive yourself. Christ has already forgiven you. So therefore, you need to forgive yourself. So I want to suggest something to you. Why not just look at, I mean, I mean you have to say the words to yourself sometimes. You have to say it out loud. Hear yourself say the words. Look at yourself in the mirror. Repeat your name. Say, Jenny. Jenny, I forgive you for X, Y, and Z. Whatever is that thing or that situation that you need to forgive yourself for. Say it to yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror. Say it as many times as you need to say for it to sink in. Forgive yourself. Be kind and be gentle with yourself. You know, just as if you were talking with a close friend or a family member that you love and who you, you know you genuinely forgive for some ill uh, that they would have done against you i want you to treat yourself just the same and forgive yourself and it means that and forgiving yourself is not easy and it means that you may have to do it daily for you know some time until it really sinks in but the main thing is to forgive yourself i encourage you to forgive yourself christ has forgiven you so therefore, you need to forgive yourself. After you've forgiven yourself, do not remind yourself of your past mistakes. Don't sit and ruminate over it and dwell on it. No, you cannot do that. And whenever it comes to mind, I want you to try and think positive thoughts. 
Think about your future. Think about how you're going to move on. Remind yourself that you've already forgiven yourself. And then just think anything positive. How am I going to move on? What do I want my future to look like? What steps am I going to take? Envision your future even. But you cannot continue to dwell on it and do not remind yourself of your mistake. And when you've done that, I want you to move forward. It is Arthur Ash who said, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. You, I mean, we have already established that we can't go back and undo the past. So it means that we can make, we can learn from the situation. We can learn whatever lessons there are to learn from the situation. We can make the best of the situation as it is now, and we can move ahead. We can take whatever action that is necessary. Use what we have now and do whatever we can with it and move forward. One of my greatest joys is looking at the sunset or looking at the, um, the sunrise. Because for me, it represents hope and new opportunities. Each day is filled with hope and new opportunities. And I, I believe the prophet captioned it well in Lamentations chapter 3. And we know it well when he talks about God's compassions and his mercies are new every morning. And that is what a new day represents for me. Hope and new opportunities. You have hope and a new opportunity. You have the opportunity for a new day. When you choose to forgive yourself, when you choose to accept God's forgiveness, when you choose to move forward, you are stepping into a new day. New opportunities and a new opportunity to do it better than you have done it the day before. Every day brings with it new opportunities. So I want to leave you with these words from Isaiah chapter 43 verses 18 to 19 and oh I love it so I'm reading the easy to read version and it says don't remember what happened in earlier times don't think about what happened a long time ago because I am doing something new now you will grow like a plant surely you know if this is true so Christ has, has told us don't dwell on the past He's doing a new thing. A new day has come for you. So you can free yourself of that prison of regret. You can free yourself of the prison of past mistakes. You can free yourself of that prison of guilt and shame. A new day has come. The prison doors have been flung wide open and you can now step into your new day. So let the brilliance of the sunshine penetrate your soul. Let the warmth and calmness of the sunset soothe you as you move forward with renewed joy, peace of mind, hope, and self-confidence. This is your new day. I am Leona. Thank you for watching this video. See you next time. of Mark chapter 4 and verse 34. Maybe you can open your Bibles or listen as I read. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Verse 35. And the same day Yes, the same day when the evening or even was come, Jesus saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. I'll come back to that shortly. We jump now to verse 39. And he arose 
and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? If I have to give a title to the message for the next few moments, it will simply be Inside Information. Inside Information. Bow your heads for just a few moments. Speak now, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Amen. It is difficult to fully appreciate all that transpired on this lake without connecting this episode to the events that took place the very same day prior to them setting sail on the sea or on the lake. Jesus, the Bible tells us, was teaching only in parables and never did he use or did he speak a word without utilizing parables. What are parables? I'm so glad you asked. Parables are narratives that seek to capture nature or human circumstance with the sole objective of teaching a spiritual lesson. Therefore, a parable must be seen as combining the physical with the spiritual. You can't have one without the other. For one seeks to reveal the other or one seeks to tell of the other. So Jesus used physical circumstance or human circumstance in order to speak on something that was spiritual. If this is so, then it is clear that that which is physical is only for us to see something deeper than that which we can see with our mortal eyes. For you should know that the invisible things of creation, so says Paul, are clearly seen, even revealed by the things which he hath made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Therefore, if the invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, it is therefore safe to say that it is the spiritual that bursts the physical into being. And if this is so, then physical things are no more than temporal, and that which is spiritual must be seen as eternal. For the things which are physical do not exist of themselves, or cannot exist of themselves, for they were birthed into experience by that which is spiritual. So the attitude that some of us may have was birthed into something that is spiritual spiritual and if that is so then temporal things you must know are of lesser value than that which is spiritual because physical things are limited by time spiritual things are not and no sooner are we recognizing that spiritual things have much more value than physical things Take, for instance, that expensive car that you boasted so much of and you talked a lot about really has no value now at is, that it's parked up in the garage. You cannot go anywhere because you are now quarantined indefinitely. As expensive as it might be, it is serving no value, no purpose right now. That expensive home that you used to put away ever so often really has no value or is not as valuable as the attitude you would have had and displayed in inviting others to enjoy its ambience. The material possessions which we now have, that healthy bank account can now begin to look malnourished because you can no longer spend it and spend it on what and where can you go to spend it anyway now that you are quarantined. Therefore, physical things are not meant to last forever. In as much as we have invested so much into that which is physical, sooner or later it can go up in smoke or be destroyed by flood. And that is what Jesus spoke on when he used parables. He used that which was physical to teach a more invaluable lesson of that which is 
spiritual because that's the kingdom he has come to set up that we will now anchor our faith on not that which is physical but that which is spiritual for that which is spiritual lasts forever and one thing i know concerning that which is spiritual that will last is the word of god we can anchor our faith into the word of god i heard one songwriter saying on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand so that's why my hope is built on nothing less than jesus's blood and righteousness because i anchor my faith in that which is spiritual for those are the things that can keep me in a time of storm. Hence the reason when Jesus spoke, let us go on to the other side. It was not simply a command, but in that command, there was a promise. He did not simply say, let us go into the ship. He said, let us go to the other side. As far as the eyesight of Jesus was concerned, he had his mind set on the ultimate destination. Not the journey, but the destination. As far as he is concerned, they are going to make it regardless of the vessel they may use. Regardless of what they are going to pass through. Jesus already saw them on the other side in that command in that word was a promise and i want to remind you that you can anchor your faith in the promise of jesus because whatever he said cannot be unsaid and his word shall not return void somewhere i read i think it was isaiah who said that the flower may fade the grass may wither but the word of our lord is going to stand forever if he says you're going to make it you can take it to the bank because you're going to make it on the grace and the power of jesus christ now you have heard the backdrop to this episode we can now enter into the boat with jesus as he is sailing to the other side because of all that had transpired in the day jesus had been walking up and down teaching he was obviously exhausted and no sooner had he entered the boat that he fell asleep and nobody disturbed him because as far as they were concerned they could handle this they got this they're gonna take it to the other side forgetting that when jesus said let us go to the other side jesus was not simply speaking to his disciples alone he knew that his father was with him that's why he slept he did not put his trust in those disciples as experienced as they were he put his faith in his father because he said i can do nothing of my own will so when he said let us he was not just speaking to the disciples but he went back to that time even when he created the world and said let us make man into our own image he was referring also to the father and you must say the same thing as you leave your house as you continue to grapple with this crisis lord let us do this let us try to make ends meet let us come to terms with the challenges that are before us jesus fell asleep and not long after he had fallen asleep the bible tells us that a great storm came i'm not sure what category it was but it was enough to make even experienced sailor men experienced fishermen scared and they began to make things to do things to keep the boat steady it is certain that at the first or at the beginning of the storm they did not bother to call jesus because they knew that jesus perhaps not only was he sleeping but he perhaps was not experienced enough to deal with this they could handle it on their own it's only when they realized that all their efforts were in vain that they called upon him isn't this doesn't this song a bit familiar? Isn't it true to say that some of you have only called upon him when you know you can't handle it on your own? All the while, Jesus was like asleep to you. But now that you are going through this crisis, all of a sudden, your Christian prayer life has awakened. Now you know how to pray. Now that you have been infected, you know how to pray. Now that a brother or sister is impacted, by this disease now you know how to call upon him 
Sometimes Jesus wants us to call upon him with the sincerity of our hearts, but we just sometimes use casual prayers to talk to him. Our devotional life is nothing more than just callous and casual. What James says is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. And sometimes he has to pass us through a storm before we learn to cry out to him. Oh, how the church is crying today. All of a sudden, the liturgy of the church is not that important as before. All of a sudden, the song service and the programming is not as important to before as before because now we are going through the crisis. Who needs a liturgy now? We need Jesus. Carest not thou that we perish. It was a sentiment over the sentiments of their heart. Lord, you don't care about us. Oh, now you recognize that you need Jesus. And the good thing about Jesus, even though we take a long time to call upon him, he still answers. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Despite the fact that we allow him to sleep during our devotional experience, we allow him to sleep during the service because we don't need him then. All of a sudden, when we are going through a crisis of this kind of proportion, we know how to call him and even when we relegate him there he still answers our prayer hasn't he answered your prayer you backslidden one you never used to go to church as before but now you're knocking on the door of heaven for him to answer you and he could turn his back on you but jesus never resists a prayer that is desperate enough for salvation even if you have not been speaking to him as earnestly and as sincerely as you should, maybe your prayer life was not as continuous. Maybe it was an unbroken paradox, an unbroken parable. Maybe things were happening that caused you to not to stutter your devotional experience. But now Jesus, in spite of it, still answered their prayers. Oh, what a God we serve and I'm certain he can answer your prayer if you truly call him and then I see him getting up and this is in my imagination I see him getting up and looking at the disciples in distress wondering what was going on and he was wondering what was going on not with the storm but with the storm that was going on in their hearts he was not concerned about the hurricane. He was concerned about the storm that was raging inside of them. Because remember, Jesus had just taught them spiritual lessons. Keep this in mind. He had taught them that what is ever happening physically is to teach of something spiritually. So if there's anybody who should have been calm through the storm, it was his disciples because they had inside information. They knew a little bit more than others. They should not be the ones whose hearts were failing for fear because he had taught them. He had just expounded all things unto them. So when he got up, they were shouting at him. And in my mind's imagination, Jesus couldn't hear a word that they were saying. And he said, what is it that you're trying to tell me? And they're shouting, you don't care that we perish. What? what? I can't hear you. And then Jesus, in the midst of trying to silence, in the midst of trying to hear them, he turns to the winds and to the waves and says, shh, I want to hear what these guys are saying. Shh just calm down a little bit let me hear what these scoundrels i mean what these disciples are saying and then they uttered their prayer you don't care that we perish and jesus asks a very strange question from surface it looks a bit silly and ridiculous here is the question that jesus asked why are you so fearful R really jesus <laughs> you want to run that by me again why are you afraid? Why are we afraid? Jesus, you're not reading the news, are you? Nearly 2.7 million have already died from or are already infected from this disease. And you're asking us, why are we afraid? In the U.S. alone, it's approaching 1 million people who are infected. And you're asking us, really, why are we afraid? 
Jesus, you're not, you're not Akura with CNN, are you? You don't really read international news. Or because you were sleeping, you didn't understand what was going on. Jesus was saying to them, regardless of what was going on in the world, I am concerned about what's going on inside of you. And perhaps that's the word he is sending to his disciples today. Yes, he is sending this word to you today. Whether you are living in Spain, in France, in Italy, in the US, in UK, in Turks and Caicos, in Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are, he's asking you the question, what's going on inside your head? Why is that so important, Jesus? It's important because there are other ships that are looking on. And you got to remember that I am in your ship, not their ship. And those who do not have me in their ship, they are looking to you who have me in your ship. That's why I'm concerned about why are you so fearful? I expect these other little ships to be fearful because I am not in the ship. But if I am in your ship, if I am in your heart, I expect you not to be among those whose hearts are failing for fear. Why, Jesus? Because you have inside information. You know me better than those in those other ships. You understand the workings of the kingdom of God. You know that this was going to happen. Haven't you read? Haven't you been reading? Forget CNN. I have created my own CNN long before that. And you have the oracles. You understand what was going to happen. And it may get worse. But you must be people of faith. Not people of fear. Why Jesus? Because you have inside information. Yes, you are blessed with more information than these other little ships. Yes, they are little ships because once I am not in their ships, then their ships are little. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm going to be excited all by myself and I'm all by myself right now. It doesn't matter. Once you don't have Jesus in your ship, I don't care how much position you have, it's a little ship. If you don't have Jesus in your ship, I don't care how much money you have, it's a little ship. I, I want you to have Jesus in your heart. I don't care what religion you serve, it's a little ship. It's small, my small thing. I'm concerned about my ship, my people, my disciples. And I want to remind you that though I am in your ship, it does not stop you from going through storms. Because I'm in your ship, you will go through storms. But because I am in your ship, you must not have a stormy attitude. You must have a faithful attitude. It doesn't mean you won't be troubled by it. But I told you, we are going to make it to the other side. And if I am in your ship, this ship is not going down once I am in it. And if you are in it with me, then you too will not go down. Praise God. You just have to remain faithful to the one who spoke to you in the first place. Because I am in the same boat with you. Wait, what? What, what did he say? Yes, you heard me right. I am in the same boat with you. You are? Yes, yes. When you were crying, I was crying with you because I am in the same boat with you when your relative and friend was dying i was crying with you because i am in the same boat 
with you. When you were troubled by the winds and the waves, I was there with you because I am in the same boat with you. I am in the same predicament as you are. The storms did not escape me. When the boat rocked, I rocked with the boat. When the waves beat upon the boat, I got wet too. I was troubled by it too. I am in the same boat with you. I am on that bed right there with you. I am in that bedroom right there with you. In that living room, I am there with you. You can't go anywhere without me because I am in the same boat with you and what I promised you what I told you in class I am now going through the same experience because I am one that will teach you in the classroom what you need to learn by experience a lot of us know in the classroom yes in your church classroom you know exactly how this will turn out but now God has taken us from the classroom and put us in the laboratory where we are experimenting and experiencing what he said in the class. We know so well. We have been through many weeks of revival. We understand what God has said. Now he wants you to experience what he has said. But I also said that you're going to make it to the other side. Once you keep me in your boat. Don't you ever pass through a storm again and cry out in despair as if you're going to lose your mind. As if things are going to be so much against you, you don't know how you will survive tomorrow. I will take care of you. David told you that, didn't he? He said he was young and he is old and he has never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I told you I will never leave you nor forsake you. So even if you pass through the water, I will be there with you. You're going through this COVID crisis. I am going to be in the same boat with you. And once I am with you, we are going to make it. Turn to somebody next to you and say, we are going to make it. And if nobody is next to you, turn to the mirror and says, we are going to make it because Jesus is in the same boat with me. And guess what? Because he is with me, connected to me, he has given me inside information. I have insight that this thing will pass. It's not what's happening to us physically that affects Jesus the most concerning his people. It's what's happening to us spiritually. Let this experience strengthen you spiritually so that the parables he expounded to you will now be exhibited in your life. Why? Because he has given all of us inside information. God bless you as you use this information to not only bless the rest of the folk on board the ship, but to be a blessing to the other little ships. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us inside information, for giving us insight and reminding us that we are not alone, that you are in the same boat with us. Because Jesus is with us, it doesn't mean we will escape the crisis. It's not whether we will pass through the crisis, but it's how we will pass through that makes the difference. Keep us steadfast. Let our hearts no longer fail for fear, but let it be strengthened by faith because you have given us inside information. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.
forever faithful towards me and you're always providing for me come on now sing great is your mercies towards me great is your oh grace Oh 